Hey, it's attorney Elizabeth Potts Weinstein. I got some requests to do videos about how to run your business online. So today we're going to talk about how to avoid the top three problems when running an online business. So the first problem we're going to talk about are chargebacks. What a chargeback is, is if you accept credit cards somehow online to buy products or services, then what can happen is that later on, someone will file a chargeback with their credit card company, with American Express, Visa, MasterCard, their bank, whatever, to get refunded the money. And typically this happens for one of three reasons. One way it happens is because they just want a refund because they're unsatisfied with the product or service. And instead of coming to you and talking about it, or maybe after they come to you and you say no, they go ahead and do a chargeback to get the money back from their credit card company. The second reason is outright fraud. So there will be people who, especially for something that's immediately delivered like an ebook, they will buy the ebook, get the delivery of the ebook, and immediately charge it back to get a refund. And they're doing it like they're they're they like the ebook. <laughs> they, they're gonna keep the ebook. They just are doing it to have the ebook and not have to pay for it. The third reason people do it is because they need the money. Typically what happens here is they buy your product or service and then like 10 months later, they file a chargeback with their bank or with PayPal or American Express or whatever to get the money back because they need that $500 to pay their rent. And they may have been perfectly happy with the product or service, but they're just trying to get cash to live. And it's really unfortunate when that happens, but it's not obviously not the right thing for them to do in that situation either. So how do you protect yourself against this? Now, you can't 100% protect yourself against this because some people are fraudulent, because some people will just do this randomly. But when someone does a chargeback, the bank or PayPal, whoever it is, will create a dispute that you can offer evidence to show how you did deliver the product or service. You have a terms of service that up says no refunds, et cetera. So what are you gonna put in that dispute? Typically you have one chance. So like if you, have, I've done this for clients where there was a dispute that was being handled by Stripe. And so what we had to do was upload our evidence and our argument. And we had one chance to do this. So you're gonna upload your terms of service and the proof that someone agreed to it. You don't just want some terms of service on your website with terms, you know, in the footer or whatever. And people don't actually read that, right? No one clicks on that except for someone like me who <laughs> reads those things. But you want to make sure that they agree to it. You can't force them to read it exactly. However, when they buy something from you in the shopping cart system, you want them to check a box or in some cases even sign that contract, that terms of service. So you can prove they agreed to it. If it's for something high end, something that costs thousands of dollars, I recommend you embed the contract somehow in your shopping cart. Um, I actually, it's one of the reasons I switched to Paperbell to do my transactions is because I want the contract to be embedded in the purchase system. So people actually sign it, they do electronic signature. Obviously you can have a pen signature too, but e-sign is just as enforceable. Or if it's buying a product that costs $10, it makes a lot more sense to just have a checkbox system. That's totally fine and also enforceable. I find that when people sign things, they it makes them more likely to read it. And that's helpful on higher end things. The last thing is you want to have evidence that you've delivered this product or service. And so you're going to have things like evidence that you shipped it, evidence that they received the product. You're going to have you know evidence that you did these phone calls. I mean, it depends on the situation, right? But you want to be able to prove up that they had it. One of the things that's very important is in your terms of service, your contract, you're going to need to have your refund policy. So if you have no refunds for any reason, it needs to state that in there. So they agree to that. There's state laws that talk about refund policies and the general rule of thumb that's going to apply in all states in different time frames is that you have to display your refund policy. I recommend doing it in your terms of service and you also may want to do it in the description itself, if you, especially if you have zero refunds for any reason. There are also some specific things you can put into play if you're selling like ebooks and electronically delivered things that are done immediately. That's a little bit beyond the scope of this, but that exists. 
So if you're planning to sell a product that someone down can download right then, you know, like the ebook or whatever it is, or it could even be something completely different. Like if you're selling uh, designs for clothing, so someone can take those plans and sew clothing, you want to make sure that they're not going to just get a refund right then. You're not, they're not going to post it online. And so there's ways to embed security in PDFs or whatever it is to reduce that likelihood, but that's going to get rid of those things 100% of the time. The main thing here is you want to be able to win the dispute process with your merchant account provider, with American Express, with, with Stripe, with PayPal, with whoever it is. So whenever this happens, which it eventually will happen, you can win that dispute and not have to give the money back. Now, side note, you want to make sure you have enough money in your business checking account such that during this process, the money comes out. It's kind of holding an escrow. So if you have people who buy a $10 ebook, hopefully you have more than $10 in your business checking account, and that's no big deal. But if you have people buy things that cost thousands of dollars, you need to always keep that kind of amount of money in your business checking account. Because at any time someone could do a dispute and that money will be held in escrow for at least 30, probably more like 45 days to 60 days. So even if you win, you don't want to like all of a sudden have less than zero dollars in your business checking account and everything bounces and it's a horrible thing. So make sure you always keep that kind of amount of money that's your typical at least one transaction in your business checking account. So if money has to go and escrow during a dispute, you can ride that through. The second big issue that happens for someone who has an online business is losing control over your website or and or domain name. Obviously, if you have an online business, your website is one of the biggest values of your business. And if you lose access to it, if it goes down, if you somehow lose control of your domain name, I mean, you're out of business for at least some period of time until you can fix that. So how can you reduce the likelihood that happens? And then it does start to happen. What are the ways where you can reduce the damage to your business and get back up as soon as possible. So the first thing is you want to make sure that your business owns your website and your domain. I think this happens less often than it used to, but it still does happen where you may hire some outside company to create your website for you because that's not your thing. There's nothing wrong with doing that, but you need to make sure that you have access to your hosting, that you own the content that the design and, and all that that they created, that you are the one that are the domain name is registered to. I've seen this many times where someone hires a company to create their app, to create their website, to create their domain name, and they don't actually have access to anything. They don't even have admin logins or anything. And then they have some dispute with them, or maybe they are ill and they're in the hospital, whatever. They're, you can't work things out with them. And then you have no access to your website. You don't own that domain name. So when you hire someone else to do it, you can just buy the domain name yourself and there's no reason to have someone else do that. It's super easy to do. You want to set up the web hosting or go with them to set up the web hosting, but you have admin access and it's under your account and not theirs. And then if you give access to them to do the stuff, you don't want them to have only the same access as you. You want, you know, you give them their own access so it can be taken back. You want to always be able to log into all your stuff. Even if you don't know how to do it, you want that that highest level admin, the main access to the account to be yours and you want to legally own it all. So going with that, when you have an employee, when you have a contractor, when you hire an outside company to design your website and create all the code behind it and everything, you need to own that. Sometimes what will happen is, is that you have custody of it. I mean, they give you all the files, but you don't actually own that content. You might have an implied license um, over the copyrights of it, but you don't own it. And in a perfect world, you would own that stuff. Sometimes it actually can make sense to just be licensing it because it may be something that they got from somewhere else. And that's the only thing they can give you. They don't actually own it. Uh, there's a lot of you don't want to start from scratch usually when you do create a website. So you use different libraries and things and they're not going to own those things. They didn't code that. They're just incorporating it into your website. However, you want to make sure that whatever they do, you either have a license to it that's in writing on paper or you own it outright. So you have control over all that. The next thing you want to look at is your social media. So this happened a lot, lot more years ago, but I think it still happens now is you'll have someone do your social media for you. 
Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, all that stuff. And it's not your thing, so you hire someone to do it. They could be an employee, they could be an intern, they could be an outside company. And just like with the website, you it needs to be yours. So something that used to happen a lot is, even with big companies back in the day, they would have their you know intern set up their social media for them because they wanted someone who was young and knew what they, do, they were doing. And it was that intern's TikTok, it was that intern's Twitter account, it was that intern's Instagram. And then they go back to school, they quit, they get pissed off, whatever happens, they leave and they take that account with them, okay? It needs to be yours. It needs to be owned by the business. And that person needs to just be running it. This is where you can really look into ways to manage admin access to things, way to manage passwords. There's a lot of stuff we can go into. And I can, I'm going to go into this in a future video where I go into all the different resources that exist to help you manage these things. Um, I use a password manager in my business and there's some passwords that I can revoke, you know, that, but I give that access to someone in my business to, you know, manage the Twitter account for the business or whatever it is, but I can easily go in there and instantaneously revoke that. Um, so you want to make sure that you re retain control over that. And as a small business, you may not have that logistically set up. So we'll talk about that more in a future video of the, the actual logistics of it, but it is something to be aware of. You want to make sure you do due diligence on the host, on the provider that you're using. You want to look at where are they located? Who would you contact? What are their policies? So web hosting, for example, there are tons of companies out there that host websites. Their servers are located all over the place. You want to know what happens when there's a problem and what kind of hosting do you have? Do you have hosting where there's going to be a gazillion people on the same server and if one of them has a problem, you also have the problem? Most hosting now is cloud hosting and that's the cheapest way. That's what I have. And I actually go have cloud hosting through like Amazon Cloud, <laughs> so some of the biggest hosting in the world, obviously. And what that means is if that giant host goes down, if Amazon S3 is down, my personal website is down. However, they're very, very robust, right? And, and tons of businesses, a significant percentage of the internet is hosted there. You wanna know how it works, where are the servers, what kinds of risks you're being exposed to. And Sometimes what happens is you may hire a web designer to create your website and they are going to have someone who codes the website and they're going to be doing the hosting for you. You want to know where that actual hosting actually is. They're subcontracting from somebody else is what they're doing. And so you want to know who the downline host actually is because if something happens with your the person that you're contact and your website is down, who are you going to contact? Where is that stuff actually located? So, because you want to be able to do due diligence on that. And they should be able to explain that to you so you understand. The last thing is you want backups. Especially of your website. You want backups of everything on your website, both the website like design and everything, as well as any databases. So like if you have WordPress, for example, if that's how your website is run, it's gonna have all the code for how it looks. And then there's a database for all the content and that content gets dynamically generated. So like they take the WordPress takes that database with the blog post written out or whatever and has the design and then dynamically generates each page. Now you may have kind of an old school website, which is what I currently have. It's mostly just HTML and CSS. And so I don't have a database that I need to download. However, you should always have a backup of your website or your app on in some local way, on your local machine, on local hard drive, whatever it is. So if your web host disintegrates, goes bankrupt, disappears, you can go to a new web host, take that website and upload it. And to do, all you have to do then is point your domain over to that new host and you're back in business. Years ago, I had a web host that was very expensive. It was supposed to have almost 100% uptime, but of course they didn't have 100% uptime and they went down and they were down for three days. This was just so terrible. It was like my business didn't exist for three days. And I learned an important lesson, which is that you can't ever depend that your website hosts, no matter how famous they are for being so robust and how expensive they are, because that was so expensive back then, that they're gonna stay up. 
you have to have backups, not just the backups they do. The backups they do is, are good. Most web hosts will have some kind of backup they do automatically. You want to down, have something that you download. It could be every time you change your website. It could be that you download it once a week. It could be every day. I mean, it depends what you have, right? Like my website doesn't get changed that often, so I just have it when I update it. Back when I had a blog that I uploaded all the time, then I, I think it was once a week. Um, so I didn't do it every with every blog post because that had been logistically difficult. And I had the blog post written somewhere else too. So I could always reproduce that last week's of work. You want something that you're actually going to do. So downloading your website every day, if you're just a one person operation, that doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, but doing it every time it gets changed, if it doesn't get changed very often, it may make sense once a week, once a month, whatever is possible for you to do. But the idea is to do it on a regular basis. So you can always move your website to somewhere else and point the domain over. Side note, I personally recommend having your domains separate from your hosting. And the reason is, is that if something happens to that company and they're both your domains and your hosting, all your eggs are in one basket and you can't do anything. But if you have your domains over here and your website over here, that means it's unlikely that both of them will go down at the same time if they're unrelated businesses. So, if your domains go down, your website still exists, you can just get a new domain and point it to it, which obviously that sucks. I mean, you do not want that to happen, but you could. And if your website goes down, you get a new web host and you point domains over. So it gives you a little bit more flexibility if you have problems, if you the hosting and the domain names are in two separate businesses. The third big problem that online businesses run to it are bad reviews. And I don't mean just someone giving you a bad review because what you did was bad because um, hopefully you're not doing anything bad. What I mean is malicious, um, unreasonably bad reviews, online harassment, it, people trying to extort you. I think this is getting worse and worse. Uh, the, what, what happens is, is that someone will go on your Yelp or Google reviews or Etsy reviews, whatever, Amazon reviews, and they'll post a review that is not even remotely true. It's just some terrible thing. It might be something that is an opinion. So it's not in the United States, um, something that you get taken down because of the first amendment free speech, because of an opinion, you know, if someone wrote a review saying, you know, Elizabeth is, um, very difficult to understand as a lawyer, like, well, maybe someone could think that it's not like a fact, right? But if someone wrote Elizabeth is a murderer, <laughs> I laugh because it's so bizarre. Um, that's a crime that I've never been convicted of and I'm not a murderer and it's a fact, you know, that can be disputed. Those are two different things. The, if someone puts malicious facts, it actually can be something that you can get taken down, but if they post opinion, it's really hard to get that taken down unless they're doing violating some other terms of service. Sometimes they'll post those things. Sometimes they'll do it just to harass you because they're mad that you didn't give them a refund or whatever. And then sometimes they do it to extort money. And extortion is illegal, by the way. Some places only the act of extortion is illegal. And in some states, even attempted extortion. So because extortion, what it is, is it's threatening harm. Like that's physical harm or harm to your reputation. Obviously, each state defines it differently. If someone does or doesn't do something, you know, and typically they're either trying to get money from you or just cash money or get you to do something or get a refund. There's a lot we could talk about that I'm not going to go into here of the legal stuff with that. You know, do you report it to the police? Do you report it to the FBI? Like, how are you going to handle that legally? I want to go into how do you keep this from happening and how to deal with the smaller problems of this. So first, when you have forums that you have control over, uh, a Facebook group, a Discord group, server, um, blog on your website with the comments, YouTube comments, have a clear comment policy and enforce that policy. So I have a po clear policy for my YouTube channel with comments that if somebody is harassing, if they're posting stuff that's hate speech, all that, they're posting spam, I just delete it. I don't like argue with them about it. I'm not gonna convince them to not have hate speech. I'm just deleting the thing and I am out right? There's, they do not even need to be here. One way to handle this kind of stuff is to have very, very clear boundaries that you enforce, no drama, you don't argue with people, you're just done, okay? That's going to help with a lot of the issues when you have control over it and you can actually delete them you, because it's your YouTube channel, because it's your Facebook group, etc. You also want to be clear on your refund and return policy. 
because some of the drama comes from people who think they can get a refund and they can't, and they never really saw that you don't have a no refund policy. And so it's a misunderstanding. And then they get angry and then they post ridiculousness. Having your refund policy stated very many places, having it with the very specific rules for it, being very clear about it, that helps a lot. Because there's a lot of people who post ridiculous things where it's just because they're mad and they didn't understand. They're not actually a bad person or fraudulent person or anything. So one way to stop that before it happens is to have very, very clear policies that you follow yourself. And this goes with the next point. If someone comes in and they're upset about your service, they're upset about the products, whatever it is, don't like just procrastinate on handling that. Handle it right then, okay? I'm not saying handle it when you're upset. You may need to go have a cup of tea. You may need to go punch your punching bag. You may need to like handle a little bit from a mental health perspective. But once you get into a more even keeled mood, Handle it then. Do not procrastinate on handling those issues because that those when those things fester, that's when someone goes and you know posts all this stuff. The next thing that you can do is actually have someone else handle it besides you. Sometimes people who actually are delivering the product, like they're making the products, you know, if you're making Etsy things that are handmade, if you're delivering services and someone's really, really upset, you it may be too personal. You may be just taking things too personally, where it's just you're not the best person to handle it. There are people you can hire. I mean, some clients hire me to do this. There are people who actually just do this kind of stuff where they handle customer service disputes. It could be that you're collecting on fees owed to you. It could be handling how the return's gonna be, whatever it is. Outsiders can handle that sometimes better than you because they don't take it personal. This is just a job for them. And a lot of times that person who's upset just wants to be heard. I've had many times with clients where there was some kind of financial dispute, whatever it was. And this person just wanted to be able to complain to somebody. And they went on and on for paragraphs and paragraphs. And I read it and I was like, thank you so much for your feedback. And that was all they needed. They needed someone to say, thank you so much for your feedback. My client couldn't do that because it was too upsetting and taking it too personally. I'm like, yeah, I didn't provide this. So like, you can give me whatever feedback you want. And I can distill it down, take all the emotion out of it and give it back to, to my client and then Thank you for giving us that feedback. So you may need somebody else to do provide that filter for you. So that way the person gets the, you know, thank you for your feedback kind of comment. And they feel like they were hurt. And then you get the information that you need without all the emotion taken out of it. Sometimes what can work is using intellectual property to handle this, this dispute. So trademarks, copyrights, those IP things that you have means that you have some control over how your trademarks are used, how your copyrights are used. This, you know, these kind of cease and desist things can work, but you have to be careful about it because it can just make the other side more enraged. So you have to look at you know, where are they posting this stuff? Are they violating the terms of service? Are they violating your trademarks and copyrights? There is definitely a fair use free speech in the United States about complaining about something. Okay, if you're stating things that aren't facts that are false, if you're stating things that are opinions or true facts, generally speaking, you can state those things and you can use someone's trademark in the sense of like, I can complain about a brand and I'm not violating a trademark because I'm like complaining about the brand, like that's part of free speech in the United States. Um, note, I am saying in the United States because, and especially even in here in California, free speech is very different in other countries. There, as I had talked about a little bit earlier, there are times where it makes sense to kind of bring in the authorities. It may be going to the website where that's where that is located, you know, to, to Amazon, to Etsy, to GoDaddy, to whoever is hosting where that stuff is. And then you may be do, able to do a DMCA, maybe to dispute the use of your trademark. You may be able to submit them for being violating the terms of service. It may make sense to bring in that authority. And there are times where it makes sense to bring in legal authorities. I'd write you, I wouldn't do that without talking to a lawyer, but it may make sense to report someone to the police, to the FBI, to all the, there's various other agencies that may become involved depending upon what exactly happened, but it can make sense to do that. You 
want to, you would want to talk to a lawyer probably to know who you'd report it to. And this can be one of the big problems with doing things online is, you know, I'm here in California and I have my website and someone and talks about my business on Instagram, but they're located in Connecticut. Like, who do I report that to, right? And it depends on what they did and the actions to me and all that kind of stuff. So you probably need to talk to somebody to get more information about where you would actually report that to. But it, there can be times where that is going to be the next step. I, but I wouldn't start there. I would first start with just dealing with things and then proceed forward unless someone's like obviously threatening physical violence and stuff like that. That's when you escalate things a lot more. So those are the three things that my clients who have an online business are dealing with the most on an ongoing basis. Um, chargebacks, control of their website or domain, and then dealing with bad publicity, reviews, online harassment, and stuff like that. Hopefully none of that stuff has been an issue for you in your business, and maybe it never will, but it's a good idea to put these practices in place in your business to help prevent them and hopefully reduce the damages if it ever happens to you. Thanks a lot for watching. If you have any questions about what we talked about today, feel free to post them in the comments below. Thumbs up if you found this helpful and subscribe if you like any more videos like this. Thanks a lot for watching.